India lives in villages. So his famous phrase. So basically, he identified the importance of the village and uh, the. Good morning, students. Welcome back to Pluto Science. So in our ninety-five days prelims challenge, uh, today we are in fourteenth day, and we are going to discuss about the local self government. So this is my favorite, one of the favorite topics, uh, and also it is uh, very much favorite for the UPSC examination also because uh, we can see many questions, many questions on the. Uh, this topic, uh, local self governments, uh, not only not only in prelims but in but also in mains examination. So each year you can see one or two questions in the mains examination also. Uh, similarly, in the prelims examination, questions are being asked repeatedly from areas of seventy third and seventy fourth constitutional amendments, Gram Sabha, or uh, grassroots level democracy. so questions are repeatedly being asked from these areas so please try to focus uh, on the lecture right first we will see about the uh, panchayat raj institutions so firstly i will uh, briefly discuss the classification so basically local bodies or local self governments governments they can be broadly divided into two one is village panchayats or governance at the rural areas rural areas next is uh, self rural self government uh, sorry local self government at the urban urban level or urban areas so for this we have panchayati raj system panchayati raj system where the uh, like gram sabha gram panchayat panchayat samiti and uh, district panchayat will come here for urban governance we have municipal bodies municipal municipal bodies for example municipalities and municipal municipal corporations so basically rural areas the 73rd constitutional amendment act act is related and the rural uh, rural self governments were brought in to the 73rd constitutional amendment and uh, the urban local governance is uh, seen under the 74th constitutional amendment so all the changes required have been brought through the 74th constitutional amendment act for urban local governance so basically this is some 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 of the uh, aspects about the division classification right first we will see the panchayat raj institutions i mean uh, the local self governance related to rural areas rural area right so in, from ancient time there is a concept called panch panch means five so the local or uh, local self governments or the governance at the grassroots level Uh, has been there since since ancient times in india that can be seen through the concept of panches also similarly when it comes to the ancient kim kingdoms so most of the ganarajas ganarajas that were there at the ancient time majorly at the foothills of himalayas basically from where the buddha also came those kingdoms were ganarajas means uh the people are directly or more directly represented in the governance process right so however um, in the recent times also mahatma gandhi ji during the freedom struggle he repeatedly emphasized the idea of local self government local self government so basically we know his uh, i mean thoughts on the village uh, village governance he said that the <coughs> india lives in villages so his famous phrase so basically he identified the importance of the village and uh, the representations of representation of the local people in the governance process so he was an ardent advocate advocate of the uh, 
self i mean uh, the local self government govern uh, local self government institutions so right now we will try to understand the importance of the panchayat raj system In importance of panchayat raj or importance of the local self government local self government bodies right so basically uh, gandhi gandhi thought that his vision was so he championed the cause of cause of decentralization decentralization means distributing or giving devolving power uh, more and more power to the uh, uh, the administrative institutions at the local level grassroots level that is at the village and uh, uh, kind of panchayati samiti level that means mandal level block or mandal level right so he emphasized the cause of decentralization he thought that decentralization as a means of empowering communities and uh, it is the solution for participatory democracy so basically gandhi gandhi thought that the panchayati raj system act as a means to empower the local communities and it uh, ensure, it will ensure the participation of communities in the governance process next is grassroots democracy so the panchayat raj institutions serve as the bedrock of grassroots democracy grassroots democracy means democracy democracy at the local level at the local level right so why uh, the principles emphasize democracy at the local level so whatever the democratic system we have we have a representative uh, democracy and the people participate indirectly in the governance process take it in central level or at the state level so earlier we have studied these aspects there is a government at the central level and similarly there is a uh, government at the state level so basically here the representatives of the people will be representing the uh, issues i mean at the central level mps are there members of parliament at the state level mlas are there members of legislative assembly so these are the representatives of the people who are representing the interests of the people so here the people are participating indirectly through the representatives so because of that reason the local self government is emphasized where people participate directly people represent themselves so they themselves become become part and parcel of the governance process so people represent their own interests they themselves represent at the local level so because of this reason the local self governments become very very important right so grassroots level democracy so <coughs> these look uh, panchayat raj institutes will ensure the community involvement in decision making process right people are directly participated directly involved here historical significance if we see so in the past traditionally panchayats held a pivotal role important role important role in the uh, social fabric of the villages so basically the village panchayats they were actively involved ensuring the welfare of the weaker sections if there are any disputes the panchayat village panchayat try to resolve, resolve those issues so in this way it has played an important role in the uh, i mean past in the past right uh, if we see the uh, time during the british era due to the uh, many kinds of laws and acts that were brought in by the britishers the basically the panchayat system existing panchayat raj institution institution have been somewhat destroyed or they went into obli uh, oblivion they became non relevant so however after the independence after the independence once again the importance of local self government has been realized and uh, the directive principles of state policy they asked they asked the state uh, that means the government to uh, ensure the uh, it underscored the need to 
realize the uh, realize and empower the village panchayats so basically we have seen article 40 under which uh, it uh, directed the state to organize village panchayats organize village panchayats so after independence the importance of the local self government has been realized and uh, the, it has been inscribed in the direct two principles uh, of state policy to organize village panchayats. So this is the importance of panchayat raj institutions. Right. Now we will understand the constitutional status for village panchayats. So earlier they were mentioned in the direct two principles of state policy. In earlier classes we have understood that this is a non-justiciable part. Non-justiciable part. So somewhat immediate uh, in after the immediate year, years of the, I mean, uh, after the independence, there were some efforts to realize the goal of ensuring uh, grassroots level democracy. But after two to three decades, the it book, uh, I mean, the interest has been subdued. I mean, there was kind of political apathy, political apathy. Uh, the local self uh, governments kind of became non functional. So, to overcome that aspect, uh, the constitutional status has been given to uh, Panchayat Raj institutions through the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act. So, right. <coughs> so, constitution urged through these amends, amendments, the constitution urged both the union government and the state governments to take measures for organizing village panchayats at the grassroots level right so uh, as i told af immediately after the independence there were some efforts to uh, realize the uh, local self government through cdm community development program was there it was started immediately after the independence during 1950s so after some decades after two decades the interest has been subdued and uh, political uh, the the <coughs> it lost the interest the local self government have lost the uh, concentration or importance interest of the political leaders at the central and state level so to overcome this uh, aspect uh, the local self governments or panchayat raj institutions have been mandated by the constitution itself so now they have to be established uh, in whatever at whatever cost right so because of this reason, constitutional status has been given to local self-governments. So basically, uh, before studying the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act, we have to study some committees and their recommendations for the uh, administration or the about the structure and uh, uh, functioning of the local self-bodies, that is Panchayat Raj institutions. So we have to study about some committees. So uh, there are many committees. The most important committees here are one is Balwant Rai Mehta Committee. Balwant Rai Mehta. So this committee is very very important. Basically this committee has suggested a three tier structure. And the second one is in that row is Ashok Mehta Committee. Ashok Mehta committee, it suggested a two-tier system, right? We will try and understand what is the three-tier uh, structure um, given by Balwant Rai Mehta committee and the two-tier structure given by Ashok Mehta committee, right? So Balwant Rai Mehta committee, this is very, very important. It established in 1957, right? It advocated for democratic decentralization through a three-tier structure of Panchayat Raj system. So basically the three tier structure is Jilla Parishad. So it will be at the district level serving as the high tier administrative body. So when it comes to village organization, village panchayat organization, at the top will be, will be Jilla Parishad. Next will be Panchayat Samiti. It will, uh, is, it will be at Mandal or block level. Right? This is a intermediate structure. So it is a block level organization. Next is village or gram panchayat. 
it will be at the grassroots level representing the village right so this is the uh, three uh, three tier structure given by balwant rai mehta committee <coughs> so the panchayat samiti was designated as the most crucial one so panchayat samiti is the middle uh, body middle structure so it is uh, it acts as an interlink between the jila parishad and the uh, village panchayat right so it acts as an interlink between the uh, the above above body and the below body right so here rajasthan was the first state to implement this model in 1951 so other states like andhra pradesh andhra pradesh uh, was the second state to implement panchayat raj system rajasthan was the first state right <coughs> so despite initial enthusiasm panchayat raj institutions faced several challenges and their kind of political apathy was there right so including government and political apathy political interference was also rampant and because of all these reasons uh, they have kind of become defunct non functional right so after uh, the janata government was formed the ashok mehta committee has been appointed to assess the conditions of the local bodies and suggest recommendations right it formed in 1978 to review the panchayat raj system and uh, it acknowledged that uh, acknowledged that it has instilled political awareness among the rural masses so the ashok mehta committee has been uh, has recognized the importance of the local self governments i mean existing prior and it said that the local uh, local people have been uh, i mean aware about the political aspects political aspects so it said that there was some kind of political education at the grassroots level due to the presence of local self bodies and uh, but it also said that uh, it has not, it has not been as successful in economic development but this political education did not converge into economic development economic development right so this is the assessment that has been given by this committee so balwant rai mehta committee sorry the ashok mehta committee it suggested as i earlier told a two tier system it suggested a two tier system right that is uh, jila parishad operating at the district level and similarly a mandal panchayat or we, call, we also call it as block panchayat so this will be an administrative unit between uh, unit between village panchayat and panchayat samiti so this is the structure suggested by the uh, ashok mehta committee right so here uh, here also the two tier system emphasized the importance of jila panchayats and panchayat samiti so unfor uh, unfortunately these recommendations faced the challenges due to uh, the fall i mean the <coughs> collapse of the janata government in 1980 right so several states like bihar uttar pradesh and tamil nadu they have delayed the conduct of elections to panchayat based on uh, some flimsy grounds we can say flimsy grounds because uh, they want to delay uh, these uh, these ele elections to these local bodies so whenever they are facing an adverse if they feel that when they feel that they are facing an adverse political uh, scenario when it comes to the particular state or particular area so because of flimsy grounds and uh, flimsy reasons they have delayed conduct of elections to the local self bodies right however the uh, new uh, agencies also initiated by the central government like drda district rural development agency also there is kapad this is a program program run from the district level so these have started actively taking the space that has been given to local self bodies so these were occupying the space given to local self uh, bodies so basically these these organizations drda kapad these programs have started 
sidelining the uh, role of the village uh, local 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 level bodies or village panchayats so <coughs> so similarly insufficient funds further limited the ability of the panchayats to undertake independent development project so all these aspects have led to the decline of panchayats all right so this was the assessment given by the uh, ashok mehta committee uh, and this is what happened after the uh, during the decades of we can say 1970s and 1980s so basically the local self government or the panchayats have seen a decline right so they have seen a declining trend and the their role was uh, <coughs> occupied uh, by the <coughs> developmental programs or bodies like drda and kapad right similarly uh, after the ashok mehta committee there was a committee ca called lm singhvi committee lm singhvi committee so basically this committee suggested giving constitutional status constitutional status to the local bodies right so based on the recommendation of the L lm singhvi committee uh, i mean the both uh, the village panchayats and the municipal bodies for uh, urban governance they have been given constitutional status through 73rd constitutional amendment and uh, for urban local governance 74th constitutional amendment have been brought in right so now we will understand <coughs> through the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment acts the local self government has been realized the goal of local self governance has been realized and we will try and understand the salient features of these acts 73rd and 74th constitution 73rd constitutional amendment act so it has uh, enacted in 19, 19 1992 73rd constitutional amendment <coughs> so basically this amendment act introduced provisions for establishment empowerment and the functioning of panchayat raj institutions for rural areas right <coughs> so there are some compulsory provisions in the act the constitutional amendment act where these have to be done <coughs> without failure so these activities are must for state governments first is retire structure so uh, the 73rd amendment act mandates a creation of a three tier panchayat raj system at the jilla block and village level so basically this is the recommendation given by balwant rai mehta committee balwant rai mehta committee right please try to remember this name uh, this has been asked previously in the prelims examination second important feature is direct elections so elections to the post of all levels be filled through the direct elections only so all the members representing these bodies shall be elected through the direct elections right third one is minimum age for uh, contesting so basically the minimum age has been prescribed as 21 years for contesting these body uh, for election to these bodies next is indirect election for chairman so basically the act prescribed an indirect election for chairmen of jilla and block levels they should be filled by uh, indirect elections so basically the members elected they will elect these chairmen the members elect the members directly elected uh, by the people these members will elect, elect the chairmen or chairpersons next is reser reservation of seats so the amendment calls for reservation of seats for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes based on proportion to their population so uh, seats for scs and sts have to be reserved based on the population their proportion their proportionate uh, 
according to their proportion, uh, proportion in pop population. Similarly, one third of the seats have to be reserved for women, right? So this is also a mandatory provision. So try to remember, uh, remember what are the mandatory provisions and what are the recommendatory, I mean optional provisions. I will discuss, later I will discuss the recommendatory provisions also. Try to remember the difference also. What are the mandatory provisions and what are the uh, non-obligatory, I mean recommendation, recommendatory provisions. Next is state election commission. So a state election commission has to be established to conduct elections conduct elections for the local bodies right next is tenure the tenure of a tenure of 5 years has been decided to all these local bodies uh, that is similar to that of the parliament and the state legislature so here also a 5 years tenure has been prescribed pres prescribed however if there is uh, if the local bodies uh, in case they in case of if they are dissolved before their completion of tenure Fresh elections have to be conducted within six months. Right. So whenever the local bodies have been dissolved before completing their tenure, elections have to be completed within six months. Similarly, another organization, State Finance Commission, on the lines of, lines of Finance Commission, they have it has to be established for distribution of revenues between the center and local bodies. So these are the mandatory provisions incorporated through the act. Similarly, we will see other features that are guidelines. These are not binding. Not binding means the state governments, respective state governments. State governments, they can or cannot make laws on this aspect. However, it is desired that the states at one point time, at one point of time, will make these uh, provisions, will make these provisions realizing, uh, saying that if these provisions also are acted upon and the provisions are implemented, the local bodies, local bodies will be empowered more, will be empowered more. So when uh, the 73rd and the 74th constitutional amendments were being made, the states were unhappy. State governments were unhappy because their power has been uh, taken and it is being given to the local bodies. So because of these, uh, these reasons, states felt that uh, their powers have been uh, taken away and these are being given to the local bodies. So because of this unhappiness, because of these reasons, some of the provisions have been made optional. So that uh, the state governments may, may feel happy and uh, over time they will take steps to realize these uh, these uh, measures what have been prescribed here. So basically it has become the duty of the state governments to uh, realize the goal of local self-government. So right, the recommendatory provisions are voting rights, voting rights to legislature. So whenever there are uh, members like MLAs and MPs are there, so the state government provide, provide opportunity for these representatives, MPs and MLAs to participate and vote in the respective local bodies, uh, whether it is, it is at the block level or at the district level. Similarly, reservation for backward classes, that is OBCs. So if the state government wants, it can provide reservation for for OBCs, right. So many states have uh, acted upon this, this recommendation and they are they have given re uh, reservation for backward classes also, right. Financial powers, so propone, uh, it proposes that Panchayat Raj institutions should be given financial powers related, related to taxation, uh, levying of fees, etc. And also efforts shall be made by the state, uh, by the Panchayats to Right. So here, uh, what is prescribed is the state shall ensure that over the time, the local bodies, local bodies will be made as autonomous. Right. So over the time, it is ensured that the local bodies shall be made as autonomous. 
so to become autonomous it should have the financial powers finan or financial independence financial independence means it should secure its own finances so it should secure its own finances for that it the local body shall have the power to impose and collect taxes so if you can see if we analyze further this is the major drawback whenever it comes to uh, panchayat raj institutions even for that matter urban local bodies also they are heavily dependent on the states states and the center also sometimes for the uh, requirements of finances so basically the state governments are not that willing to grant taxes and powers to the local bodies so because of that reason the local bodies are increasingly depend on, dependent on the uh, grants from the center government and also from the state uh, state governments especially state governments so because of this lack of financial independence they are not able to function as autonomous bodies so still they are dependent they are surviving on the grants given by the state governments and the central government so when we discuss the main aspects we will discuss the challenges of the uh, local self bodies in that we will talk about 3f lack of funds functions and functionaries so they are the local bodies are suffering from these aspects 3f and also there are many problems like social issues caste aspects will come into play and there is political apathy and there is a delay in conducting elections after completion of tenure so there are flimsy on the flimsy grounds the elections are not being conducted and they are um, postponed perpetually similarly there are concern, concerns about functioning of the state election commission state election commission similarly state finance commission so these bodies are not con uh, functioning properly similarly there is a provision for dpc district planning committee and uh, metropolitan area metropolitan area planning committee so there is a provision for planning at the grassroots level also so these bodies are also not functioning as desired so due to all these reasons the local self governments are not able to uh, work as autonomous bodies similarly the local bodies also suffer from the problem of uh, employment employees so basically uh, the employees are not exclusively appointed for the local bodies they are uh, i mean these employees of the state government state government they have they are sent on deputation so basically the employees those come on deputation they lack interest uh, whenever it comes to uh, functioning effectively so these are some of the problems that all that have been faced by the local self governments when we discuss main topics we will try and focus more on these aspects right so we will understand now understand the composition of panchayat and their powers so basically composition and powers will be overlapping with the whatever the mandatory and optional uh, obligations put on the state governments with respect to a uh, panchayat raj institution so we will briefly survey the composition of panchayats and uh, their powers so first is three tier structure we have understood this one so three tier structure will be at jilla parishad panchayat samiti at, at the block level and the village panchayats at the village or for a group of villages so one exception is small states with a population of less than 20 lakhs they can skip the second tier right so option is given for those states small states so they can skip the second tier village uh, sorry sorry panchayat samiti right direct elections we have uh, understood this so the members of for the local self bodies have to be elected through direct elections right reservation of uh, representation of legislator so basically mps and mlas can be made uh, ex officio representatives in this local self governments right <coughs> so panchayat samitis there is a provision uh, for uh, panchayat samitis samitis also they will be at the intermediate level right inclusion of village panchayats chairpersons so basically the chairpersons of village panchayats they can be made representatives at the panchayati samiti right this provision if a state government wants 
they uh, it can make this provision right similarly reservation of states so state uh, seats uh, can be reserved for uh, scs and uh, sts based on their population and similarly one third of the seats have to be reserved for women <coughs> right reservation is also provided for the offices of chairperson so whatever the reservations are applicable they are applicable not only for the members but also for the positions of chairpersons <coughs> right the reserved seats are allotted allotted by rotation to different constituencies in a panchayat area so this reservation is applied based on the rotation principle right similarly term we have understood that five years tenure has been given to this local self government however if uh, if they are dissolved before the completion of the tenure elections have to be completed within 6 months next we will understand the powers and responsibilities of this uh, local self uh, governments so this is a important area try to focus on this area question may arise from this area so state legislatures have the authority to endow panchayats with necessary powers and authority for self government at the grassroots level so basically the responsibility the onus is on the state governments they may devolve necessary powers and functions to the local bodies to make the local uh, local level bodies as autonomous autonomous governing bodies right so panchayats may be interested with the responsibilities for preparing plans related to economic development try to remember these phases the local bodies can make plans to make uh, the village areas local areas uh, to realize economic development and to ensure social justice so for realizing these aspects the local self bodies can make plans right similarly they can also initiate schemes to realize various aspects like uh, agriculture education health sanitation drinking water so as you can uh, see from the nature of these subjects these are very much related to local level means they can be well managed from the local level these aspects can be well managed from the local level so because of the local uh, because of this reason the local the local bodies can initiate schemes for uh, important uh, to improve the aspects such as agriculture education health sanitation drinking water rural housing and the welfare of the weaker sections so because of this reason there is a concept called gpdp that is gram panchayats gram panchayat development plan so all these schemes can be initiated through the gpdp gram panchayat level gram panchayat development plan so also the goal here Uh, for realizing the economic development and the social justice also plans can be made under the gpdp gram panchayat development plan right so three uh, uh, three tier structure of panchayat raj system we have seen uh, however we will do a brief survey to uh, revise it one more one more time so first one is at the panchayat panchayat at the village level at the grassroots level Uh, though there the organizations are very very important organization gram sabha so this is we can say it is we can call it as the foundation foundation for foundation uh, for grassroots grassroots democracy grassroots democracy at the village level right so uh, the gram sabha plays an important role in the structure of local governance so similarly when we see at the governance at the central level we have parliament right if we see at the state level state level we have state legislature right so when it comes to local level the gram sabha plays that role the constitution has invested lot of powers in the institution of gram sabha so try to remember this aspect 
so basically we can call it as the foundation of the local level local self governance right <clears throat> so it symbolizes the direct democracy so whatever we see in the parliament or the state legislatures uh, that is indirect democracy the representatives of the people are representing there representatives of the people are sitting there but here people themselves are representing them right so basically the gram sabha comprises all adult residents all adult residents in a village or group of villagers right so basically it conducts at least two meetings annually the constitution mandates that two to four meetings shall be conducted within a year so basically it should conduct at least two meetings within a year so <coughs> so in that meetings it should discuss accounts audit reports and recommend development projects right similarly it identifies the individuals for economic assistance so basically over the time the importance of gram sabha has been increased so basically now it identifies the beneficiaries for manrega so there are lot of schemes like indira avas uh, sorry um, pm ay prime pradhan mantri avas yojana is there right similarly uh, health schemes are there several health schemes are there right so uh, to uh, to i mean the gram sabha plays an important role in identifying the beneficiaries for all these aspects right similarly we have swachh bharat also swachh bharat is there manrega is there pmay is there pradhan mantri avas yojana similarly we have ddu gky so right we have all these schemes for the betterment and the welfare of the rural areas so the gram sabha plays an active role to uh, identify or scrutinize beneficiary for all these schemes similarly we have pds also public distribution system so to identify in identifying and scrutinizing the beneficiaries for all these schemes the gram sabha plays very very important role right similarly next is gram panchayat so gram panchayat is equal to council of ministers uh, in previous classes we have understood the council of ministers will be there uh, at the central level or at, uh, and at the state level so this will basically uh, oversees the day to day administration it uh, takes up the important administrative aspect so similar similarly that role will be played by the gram panchayat at the village level so basically it is the basic unit of panchayat raj at the village level members are directly elected basically we call these members as the ward members all right so the number uh, depends on the population village population right so elections are based on the single member constituencies i mean from one ward only one member will be elected here also one third of the seats are reserved for women and uh, reservation is also there for scs and sts based on their population size of populations so here the chairperson of this panchayat gram panchayat will be known as sarpanch pradhan or president so there will be a position of vice vice chairperson also so monthly meetings will be held to address the local governance issues so this is the important information about the uh gram panchayat next is nyay panchayat so basically earlier when 73rd constitutional amendment act in, uh, was uh, enacted this nyay panchayat uh, institution was not there it was brought through the gram nyalaya nyayalaya act 2018 so here apart from administration uh, the <coughs> the emphasis was on legal justice also right so justice uh, the legal justice uh, has also to be ensured for the people basically we know the problems in accessing the judiciary accessing the judiciary there are lot of problems the people at the grassroots level or at the village level they do not have that knowledge knowledge or capability to access the justice at the top level uh, let's say in the high courts or in the supreme court so to provide 
the justice at the village level itself, at the local level itself, the Gram Nyayalaya Act has been brought in through uh, in the 2018. So uh, based on the act, every village or any, uh, every Gram Panchayat has been provided with uh, Nyaya Panchayat to write. <coughs> Uh, the provisions under it are judicial panchayats or nyay panchayats will be resolving the local disputes right it offers speedy and cost effective justice right so basically the jurisdiction of these bodies vary typically covers petty civil and uh, criminal cases petty means simple simple uh, criminal and uh, civil cases are covered under it Basically, this is to provide a solution to the disputes at the local level itself because uh, the people at the local level are not capable of accessing the higher judiciary, right? So basically here, there is no concept of legal representation. Basically, the lawyers will be representing the parties in the higher judiciary. So basically, that concept is not applicable here. The parties argue their own cases, right? Next, we understand the structure at the Panchayat Samiti, Tier 2 level. <coughs> so basically, this is known as Intermediate Tier and it connects the Gram Panchayats with the Jilla Parishad. So membership depends on the population size of the, the particular block. So ele directly elected members, members are directly elected and the chairperson is elected indirectly. Indirectly, right. So rotation system for Sarpanch's membership. So, Sarpanch's of the villages will be represented here through rotation basis. So, it also may include legislative assemblies, members of the legislative assemblies, legislative councils and parliament members hailing from that particular region. Right. The third tier is district level. It is the uppermost tier in the Panchayati Raj system. Right. So, members also directly elected but the chairperson is elected indirectly, right? Ex officio members include Panchayati Samiti chairpersons, right? Nominated members can be included MPs, MLAs and MLA, MLCs from the particular district. So chairperson, Adhyaksha or president and vice president, they will be elected from the members elected. So directly elect, they are elected by the members elected by the people. So basically, for chairperson and vice chairperson, indirect elections are prescribed. Indirect elections are prescribed. So it conducts the monthly meetings and forms subject wise committees also to oversee the, the administration. So basically, this is the structure in the Panchayati Raj uh, institutions. Now we will understand the functions at each level, right? Basically, the panchayats also have. Obligatory functions, uh, the obligatory functions include, so try to remember this list, some items may be picked from here and they may be put under the question as an option. So you should be in a position to, uh, I mean, decide on the particular uh, option, whether it is included in the functions of the Panchayati Raj institutions or not. Also, you have to remember the fact that it is whether it is an obligatory function or it is an optional function. So that's why I'm providing the entire list here. Basically, the obligatory functions of the Gram Panchayats are sanitation, cleaning public areas, maintenance of public infrastructure at the village level. Similarly, public health initiatives, it can take health initiatives and uh, vaccination and the primary health care. So basically, primary health, primary health centers. PHCs work under the control of the Gram panchayats also, uh, gram, gram panchayats only, right. Similarly, supply of drinking water and the construction of public wells, uh, street lighting and uh, social health services, primary and adult education. So basically the primary education and adult education is also the responsibility of the village panchayats. Similarly, there are optional functions, uh, tree plantation, breeding centers for cattle and agriculture promotion child and maternity welfare activities. So this is also very, very important function, though it is optional. So recently there are various developments which made obligatory for including the measures for child and maternity welfare in the 
GPDP, Gram Panchayat Development Plan. So try to remember this aspect also. Right. Similarly, implementation and monitoring of poverty alleviation program. So there shall be a provision uh, in the GPDP, Gram Panchayat Development Plan about the poverty alleviation. Right. Similarly, preparation of annual development plans and budgets for the Panchayat area. So basically, this is nothing but preparing a GPDP, Gram Panchayat Development Plan. Similarly, relief in natural calamities and uh, removal of encroachments on public lands. So basically, these are some of the optional functions of the Gram Panchayats. Similarly, we will understand the functions of Panchayat Samiti. So basically, it has to take up developmental activities. So the Block Panchayat, he is headed by the Block Development Officers. They oversee agriculture, land improvement and uh, watershed development, right? So you can see the functions are here somewhat broader, somewhat broader functions have been given to the block panchayat. Similarly, implementation of specific plans and schemes with earmarked funds. Similarly, spending allocated funds on designated projects while having choices regarding location and beneficiaries. So basically the panchayat samiti has also some responsibilities and it has the independence of disposing the funds at its disposal for relevant programs in a relevant area. Right, we will understand the functions of the Jilla Parishad, coordination and supervision. So links and supervises the activities of panchayat samitis within the district. Similarly, it coordinates the district plans, integrating plans from samitis for submission to the state government. So this is one of the important area of working for the Zilla Parishad. So developmental work, it, it undertakes the district wide developmental projects, including agriculture initi initiatives, rural electrification and uh, public works. So it also initiates employment generating activities and the construction of roads. Similarly, it has some welfare functions also provides relief during natural calamities and the scarcity, establishes orphanages, poor homes, night shelters, and promotes welfare of women and children. So these are some of the welfare duties that have been interested for Dilla Parishad. Similarly, the central and state government programs, so there are certain uh, duty on the Dilla Parishad in implementation of Central and state sponsored schemes. So the Jilla Parishad, uh, the Jilla Parishad has the responsibility of implementing the state and uh, central sponsored schemes. So basically, one scheme, uh, one scheme we can understand. MGNR is here, Manrega. Similarly, Swachh Bharat also. So the Jilla Parishad has the responsibility to implement these schemes. Similarly. It uh, manages schemes like Jawahar Rojgar Yojana and Employment Generation Scheme. So these are some of the functions of the <coughs> uh, Jilla Parishad. So till now we have understood the uh, Panchayati Raj system. I mean local level governance for the rural areas, for the villages. Now we will understand for urban, uh, the local self-governance for urban areas, urban local bodies. Uh, earlier we have seen that there is a different structure for uh, rural areas and a uh, different structure for urban areas. Now we will see the governance process in the urban areas. Right. So basically here for urban governance we have municipalities and municipal corporations. So basically we have different, uh, uh, I mean different areas, urban areas based on population size population size. So based on population, different types of municipal bodies have been established, right? <clears throat> so basically urban areas characterized by compact and dense populations. So it require effective municipal administration to provide essential civic facilities. So basically the function should be water supply, drainage, garbage disposal, public health services, primary education, and construction and maintenance of road, 
Similarly, sanitation also plays an important role. Right. So all these re, uh, all these aspects require a special type special setup for overseeing the administrative aspects of the local areas. Similarly, if you see the roles and the responsibilities of these bodies, basic civic facilities. The urban local bodies have to provide some basic civil facilities. So it should provide, they should provide fundamental civic amenities necessary for urban life. Similarly, they have to oversee the uh, local governance. So they have the authority to raise taxes, collect fees and impose fines uh, to fund various civic services. So we have discussed, so they have to provide various civic services to make sure that those services are provided. They have certain taxation powers and they can uh, impose certain fees so that the resources are mobilized to implement those schemes. Right. Similarly, the municipalities or uh, municipal, um, municipal corporations have certain regulatory functions like regulating the city life by formulating and enforcing regulations pertaining to buildings, road networks and garbage disposal. So basically, these are the regulatory functions of the urban local bodies. Similarly, they oversee the developmental activities like uh, uh, they engage in various developmental activities, right? So these are the some of the functions of the urban local bodies. Similarly, they have to ensure participative urban development. So through uh, local taxation, so they have the power to impose taxes and collect fees from the public. So this revenue is crucial for financing the civic facilities and the developmental projects, right? Regulation of city life also we have seen. It regulates and make rules for uh, proper, I mean, uh, kind of decent city life to ensure decent and uh, proper city life, right? Similarly, it take, takes up the developmental initiatives like uh, providing hospital services, right? Uh, taking up sanitation activities, right? So these come, similarly, it can take up the certain employment generating activities also. Employment generating activities also. So it can take up certain developmental activities, right? So these are, uh, all these activities ensure a participatory uh, development, participatory development mechanism at the urban level, right? Now we will see the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act. So through which the urban local bodies ha have also been made as constitutional bodies. Right. So there is a, I mean, the, the urban local bodies have been provided constitutional status through the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act. So it has been enacted along with the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act in the same year, 1992. So this brought about significant reforms in the structure and the functioning of the urban local self-governing institutions, right? So basically, uh, it formulated various, I mean, various commissions and committees have been formed to enhance the effectiveness and empowerment of the urban bodies. So the recommendations of these committees have been incorporated in this particular act. We have seen two important committees, Balwantarai Mehta Committee. Similarly, Ashok Mehta Committee also we have seen. Right. Basically, based on the recommendation of LM Singhvi Committee, the urban local bodies also given the constitutional status. So now we will understand the compulsory provisions. So similarly under the, uh, similarly under, as under the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act, the under the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act also, there are certain compulsory provisions and there are certain guidelines. I mean, non-compulsory provisions are there, right? Similarly, compulsory provisions are local urban bodies how to be created such as Nagar Panchayats, Municipal Councils, and municipal corporations. 
so in small big and very big urban areas respectively so try to remember this nomenclature nagar panchayats municipal councils and the municipal municipal corporations have to be established in small in small cities nagar panchayats in big cities <coughs> municipal councils and in very big cities municipal corporations have to be created similarly reservation of seats so scs and sts have to be provide provided reservation according to the size of their population and similarly women's reservation one third of the seats have to be reserved for the women <coughs> similarly state election commission has to be established for conducting regular elections to the urban local bodies state finance commission has to be uh, established and uh, it its recommendation should be considered for uh, distribution of finances between the state government and the local bodies uh, the urban local bodies similarly tenure five years tenure has been prescribed for urban local bodies also so these are some of the compulsory provisions if you see the voluntary provisions voting rights so voting rights can be provided to mlas we have seen mlas mlcs and members of parliament so if a if a particular state government wants representation and voting powers have to be given to the the these uh, members they can be given representation and voting rights in the urban local bodies also similarly reservation for backward classes if a particular state government wants it can give reservation to the backward classes in the local urban local bodies financial powers similarly the state can delegate powers like imposing taxes collecting fees etc these powers can be given to the local bodies so as we have understood when we were studying the panchayat raj system so many state governments have uh, not provided these powers to the urban local bodies also so because of this reason it is working as a, a severe handicap on the autonomy of the urban local bodies also because they do not have sufficient and proper financial powers right <coughs> right so similarly autonomy and devolution so the state governments how shall uh, i mean they can make measures to make the lo urban local bodies uh, autonomous bodies autonomous and independent bodies right. so this uh, provision can include the power to make plans for economic development of the urban populace so similarly the uniform regulation basically the 74th constitutional amendment act try to provide a uniform urban governance uniform urban governance for the entire country right so the 74th constitutional amendment act try to bring in a uniform urban governance for the entire country right now we will understand the composition of the municipal bodies so basically they are constituted through the direct elections individuals with individuals chosen from the territorial constitutions within the municipal area right <clears throat> so however the state has the authority to enact laws that provide representation uh, in a municipal body for members of the lok sabha uh, uh, rajya sabha and the legislative members of legislative council and the legislative assembly also so these members can also be represented in the municipal bodies if a particular state chooses to do so right similarly the chair persons of the ward committees can also be included in the composition right similarly uh, the empowerment and reservations for weaker sections so basically empowerment of weaker sections by giving them reservation reservation uh, basically for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes according to the proportion of their population office reserved offices so basically this reservations have to be provided not only for the members but also for, for the chair persons including 
mayor so these uh, reservations are applicable at the chairperson's level also term duration so basically we have understood the local bodies have the duration of 5 years right now we will understand the functions of the urban local bodies <coughs> so basically these powers can be organized under two heads first is deliberative functions deliberative function means the functions that are equal to a legislative body for example state legislature state legislature or parliament so these are forums for deliberative or deliberate functions so basically the urban local bodies have two functions one is deliberative function similar to that of state legislature or parliament and the second one is executive functions so basically the functions done by the executive that is uh, council of ministers uh, headed by prime minister or council of ministers headed by the chief minister so basically these executive powers are also there so first we will understand the deliberate process deliberative process composition so the deliberative part consists of corporation council municipal board comprising elected representative so these bodies comprise of elected elected representatives they functions their functions include discuss and debates discussion and debates on general municipal policies and performance similarly passes the budget for urban local body frames broad policies related to taxation resource pooling etc right it also monitors the municipal administration and holds the executive accountable for its actions and inactions right so these are the deliberate functions uh, that are done by the urban local bodies similarly we will understand the executive part so for executive part the leadership is provided by the municipal officers and other uh, permanent employees so basically this is these people are coming from the government side so the state government appoints these officials right so key official here is the municipal commissioner so he serves as the executive head try to remember this aspect so basically the municipal commissioner he is appointed by the state government he is the com com uh, uh, key official when it comes to executive powers executive aspect right so he is the executive head at the uh, municipal level right so similarly in municipalities an executive officer holds a similar position managing overall admin administration right so now we will understand the classification of municipal functions so obligatory functions are there and there are <coughs> discretionary functions i mean these are optional right the obligation obligationy ob obligation functions the local body municipal body has to do them at any cost they are obligatory so they include water supply road construction maintain road construction and maintenance street lighting drainage sewerage garbage collection prevention and control of epidemics vaccination etc so all these are mandatory functions of the municipal bodies similarly there are certain discretionary functions i mean non -volunt uh, voluntary functions like uh, <coughs> rescue homes orphanages housing for low income groups public uh, receptions and uh, treatment facilities so uh, the if a municipal body chooses to do all these things it can do it basically we will understand the difference between municipal corporations and municipalities so basically the municipal corporations often undertake broader range of functions because the municipal corporations are established in very big cities so because of this reason the municipal corporations undertake broader range of functions when compared to the municipal municipalities right <coughs> so city development activities when it comes to city development activities so municipal corporations such as delhi mumbai vadodara pune so these are very big cities they uh, take they recognized for their diverse city development initiatives including public transport so these municipal corporations are uh, i mean providing a public 
transport. So we can understand in Delhi, <coughs> Delhi uh, Municipal Corporation itself provides uh, the transportation, public transport system. Similarly, it provides parks, it provides open spaces. Similarly, municipal juice, even services like milk and electric supply are being provided by the municipal corporations. So, for Delhi, for if we take the example of milk, provi milk provision, so we have a Delhi milk scheme, it is there. So, under this scheme, milk is provided by the Delhi municipal corporation itself. Right. So, final and important aspect, we will try and understand the sources of financial uh, sources of finances for the municipal bodies. So earlier in this lecture itself, we have discussed that finances is a big problem, big problem for local bodies. They are unable to garner the resources required for uh, implementing the day-to-day -day activities to deliver their functions. So they are increasingly dependent on the funds or grants from the states and even from central government. So because of this reason, this dependency, they are unable to function as autonomous units. Right. <clears throat> when we discuss the main topic, we will discuss uh, and uh, devolve deep into this aspect and we will also understand the probable solutions to address this problem. <clears throat> Here in this lecture, we will try and understand the sources, some of the sources for funds for municipal bodies. So, own revenue sources. So it can impose uh, uh, taxes, uh, certain taxes on land and buildings. Uh, the major part of the income is coming through this uh, taxation only, taxation on the land and properties, land on the buildings. So other taxes include uh, professional tax and uh, tax on animals, vehicles, theatres, etc. So <clears throat> after the enactment of uh, GST, many of these indirect taxes indirect taxes are there. So, they have also been subsumed. For example, octroi tax was there. Octroi tax was there. So, this was the one of the major sources for uh, uh, local bodies. So, when GST came, this was octroi tax was subsumed into the GST. So, in that way, the local bodies have been <coughs> deprived of one important source, in one important source of taxation. Right. Similarly, they can impose fees and fines <coughs> so, fees can be uh, levied on various services such as water supply, etc. Similarly, fines can be, can be imposed for breach of municipal rules and regulations. <coughs> Similarly, it can impose taxes on municipal enterprises. Uh, see, we have understood the major source of, till the major source, majority of the funds come, come from grants from the state government. Similarly, uh, the state government provides grants to the local governments. Specific taxes, they can uh, lay specific uh, taxes like water tax, <coughs> sewerage tax, fire tax, theater tax, duty uh, on transfer of property, etc. Also, they can impose certain taxes. So, basically, these are the <coughs> some of the sources for uh, finances for the municipal bodies, municipal local bodies, right. Now we will see <coughs> two questions that are being asked from the <coughs> local self-governments previously in the examination. The first question, <coughs> it is asked in 2017. <coughs> the question is, local self-government can be best explained as an exercise in federalism, democratic decentralization, administrative delegation, direct democracy. So when we see it, <coughs> all these aspects are directly or indirectly one way or the other are related to local self-government only but the local self-government can be best explained in democratic decentralization so the very uh, heart and soul of democratic uh, decentralization the local self-government dependent depends on the democratic decentralization decentralization right so administrative delegation it is not complete. It doesn't involve complete transfer of powers. So it doesn't it does not include complete transfer of power. So it is not there. So basically, the essence of local self-governance is 
the democratic decentralization of powers so so basically this is a conceptual question try to remember these kind of questions also so it is very important to focus on the focus and understand the conceptual aspects when it comes to quality subject right the second question it is asked in 2012 so which of the following provisions of the constitution of india have bearing on education so if we can say this is a very broad question it is uh, kind of covering all the aspects uh, many aspects that uh, come in the quality subject so it is the question is that which of the following provisions of the constitution of india have bearing on education so the aspects are direct to principles of state policy rural and uh, urban local bodies <laughs> here is our topic next is fifth schedule sixth schedule and seventh schedule so we can see the education aspect is mentioned in direct to principles of state policy we have studied that and uh, education is an important component when it comes to urban and local bodies we have seen it uh, comes under obligatory functions right similarly we can understand in fifth and sixth schedules also there are <coughs> emphasis there is emphasis on education basically these fifth and sixth schedule are to <coughs> oversee the administration in scheduled and tribal areas scheduled and tribal areas so here also education is an important aspect so education is there in the uh, this one seventh schedule basically seventh schedule distribute powers it distributes powers between center and the states we have understood three lists center list is there state list is there and the concurrent list is there right so we have understood that education is at present in present it is under the concurrent list earlier it was in states list uh, through the 42nd constitutional amendment act it has been removed from the states list and uh, brought brought under the concurrent list so in this way all the five principles provisions uh, are related to bearing they all have a bearing on the education so correct option is option d 1 2 3 4 and 5 right so <coughs> uh, this is all for today i hope you have gained uh, some important and uh, relevant information uh, about the local self governments local uh, local level, grassroots level democracy i hope this information will help you in the upcoming examination thank you thank you for joining the lecture uh, this is it for today see you tomorrow until then bye